everyone good afternoon. Uh, I think a good way to start this presentation is talking about Maxwell equations, which are very you know, friendly and cool. And the explanation is pretty obvious. So the first time I saw Maxwell equations, the professor went to the room and said the same thing, like, good morning, let's talk about Maxwell equations. And he wrote down the equations and said some things that you can read. And this caused like some different effects on people. Like some people slept, some people like felt totally lost. <laughs> some people like said, oh that's pretty. But I can understand this. And some people were few people actually were pretty okay with this kind of approach. So this talk is going to show you some of my frustrations and and some mechanism that I found to deal with this, uh, especially uh, when we talk about math and physics and when we talk about learning this kind of subject, and I'd like to expose some of my personal points here. Uh, so this is a quick introduction about me. I'm Hanali, I am from Brazil, I travel like 17 hours to get here, so I live up this far. And one interesting point, like, it's colder, in Brazil than here, which is totally awkward for me. This is the first thing this is the first time that I saw something similar. So it's hot here in Portland. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so these are some information about me. You can if you want to tweet, uh, I created a hashtag humanizing science and my Twitter is Analita, so you can find this presentation later. Uh, so maybe some of you might have asked like why is she talking about math and physics at Open Source Bridge? Uh, this is a pretty valid question, like, did you attend college? Most of you, yes. Uh, did you have like subjects like calculus or physics or fluid mechanics or stuff like this? Yes. So I know that we have like slightly difference between a Brazilian teaching and the teaching here in the United States. But they have like some friends here, and they have similar t similar points that with me. Uh, we were both frustrated about education of math and physics. So I would like to tell some stories about my undergrad course involving all the subjects. Like I had, I actually studied all of the subjects, but most of the time I learned just enough to pass the test. I didn't learn. I don't know if you identify yourself, maybe calculus 3, which is vectorial calculus, like I learned it to pass the test. And this is bad, because don't you feel like you are wasting your time? Don't you feel a bad person? And I'm cheating. I'm learning to get 7 and get approved. So this is wrong. And the problem is not you, the problem is not your teacher, the problem is mainly your, our education system. Did, did you identify with some of this scenario? Maybe like calculus one was like, whoa, that's amazing, you studied, you learned it, but you know, I don't feel like you've done, most of you haven't done this for all those subjects. I cheated a lot during my five years in the undergrad course. So, this can be scary for most of people. <laughs> this is exactly what happened in my first year. Uh, everyone was scared about calculus. Everyone, like everyone. I, I just met a guy, but he was, you know, he was an exception. He was totally comfortable with calculus and physics, and physics too, and calculus too, and calculus great. But the other students, we were frightened with the subject. And when the, when the professor came and like said good morning and please solve this equation and give like, you know, a uh, closed path integral to solve, I always ask him, why do I need to solve this? This is a valid question. Why am I solving like a closed path integral at 7 a.m.? Why? <laughs> Tell me why. There must be a good reason for this. I would like to be programming. You know? Do you identify with 
because I had my favorite subjects, my favorite subject was like algorithms, programming, uh, maybe electronics. I wanted to be into the electronics lab doing, you know, ah, I want to feel like a hacker. And I was there at 7 a.m. solving a closet path integral. Why? Tell me, please tell me why. And another question that I always made to my professor was, who did create this? Because this didn't appear in the universe. Someone did this thing. And how did this person thought about this? When I met Maxwell equations, I was like, whoa, that's wonderful. How did this guy thought about this? How? Like magic, he went to sleep and he woke up. I have four magical equations here. And I know about their professors, but very few professors of my university gave proper context of the things. Most of them like three of the subject. So good morning, we have this structure, which is a closed path integral. So let's be happy with this. Like, like magic. He came up with something to his pocket and you know, took the, the, the chalk and wrote something, and that's it. No, it's not that's it. Come on. There should be something. So I didn't have proper context when learning this subject. Into the school, into the university, I didn't. Did you have? Like, first, one subject or other, yes, I did. I did like, I had like wonderful professors. But in most cases, I didn't. So I became frustrated uh, because I saw, like, I spent a lot of time studying alone to understand things, but what I saw in my friends is like they were frustrated with this lackness of context. <clears throat> and this calls a sentence like this, I hate calculus, I hate physics, I hate this STEM closed path integral, I failed in the, the test because of this, I hate this, this shit. I want to be doing just programming. Are you familiar with this context? So I actually don't agree with this. I think it's mainly an educational problem. Uh, but this was a warning sign for me. Uh, I was doing a course where we had to evaluate each other. So each student had to evaluate itself. By that time, I had good grades because I was studying by myself. And I was like motivated to do calculus and solve integrals and stuff because I was, you know, understanding the concept of this. And one feedback that I had was like, hey, you are not human. Come on, I can't understand this bunch of integrals that you are writing here. Come on, you are not human. I am a human and you, come on, help me to understand your mathematics. So at this time, I started to think that I was being dehumanized by the system, which is not good, because I've still been a human being. Uh, so this feedback was very important for me. It was by that time that I started to think about our educational system, about how we learn things, about like how do you motivate your friend who wants to write code to study calculus? This is important because you know, motiv motivation is, you know, something that keeps, uh, that helps us to do nice things. And so I started to think about this kind of problem. Uh, and then I, I thought about some techniques to humanize uh, the education uh, related to math and physics. So they work pretty well for me. I am not a professor, but like in the, the office that I work at, I can talk to people about math just by doing this. I can talk to some undergrad students that I know and I can make them you know, feel passion and motivation about the subjects just by talking to them, which is pretty amazing. I, I, I wish I had someone who gave me this kind of motivation when I was an undergrad student. So the first technique, that I saw is tell the story behind the equation. Don't start your class with good morning, let's solve this closet integral path. Uh, start talking the true story behind it. Because behind it, behind 
that symbol we have a person or a group of people. Uh, some professors try to do this. I had some professors that you know they, they cheat. They are pretty, you know, it's cheating. They start with uh, a sentence like, in 16th century, someone did something. Okay, and this now let's solve the equation. Come on, this is not this is not a history. This is not you know it's just a random date. And people probably don't need to know this. So don't do this. This, this, this is not history. Uh, don't, the, the history of the science is behind it. And show that they were human, like, like you, like these students, like everyone. Um, so this is interesting because when you start talking about the history behind the equation, behind uh, a problem that was solved behind any, anything, you can find interesting subjects to call people's attention. So, for example, you can find family dramas. This is something that people usually pay attention to, don't you think? Like, hey, my brother was stabbed. Like, wow, what? But this is interesting. Like, okay, I don't know any case of uh, stabbing, but I know a case of a family that gave us like seven or eight mathematicians, and all they were brilliant, so maybe you can use this. I am talking about Bernoulli's family, so maybe you have heard about them. Some equation of some Bernoulli around the world. Uh, so this is a, a classical example. Then you can talk about family dramas. Or there is a cliche one. Uh, Many mathematicians of Renaissance time, they were not simulated by their parents to study mathematics. So for example, Pascal is a good example. Like his father tried to hide all mathematical books from him because he wanted that his kid was studied like <laughs> theology or maybe medicine or something. And he hides everything from his kid and of course, you can imagine what happened, like Pascal like locked himself at his, his uh, bedroom and he started creating geometry. So he was able by the age of 12 to create everything that Euclid created. Not everything, but most of the things. He, he just didn't know the names, like he didn't know that a circle was called a circle, so we called the circle like round. <laughs> He was able to calculate angles, you know, to do all that geometry stuff alone. So this this is interesting. Like, don't treat Pascal like, okay, now we have Pascal triangle. No, there is <laughs> someone behind it. And someone with a very interesting story, another interesting fact about Pascal, that when his father saw this, he was like, what? <laughs> Was it my son? And then he took his child and, uh, and he asked him, like, how did you do this? He that I just figured out that, you know, I could calculate this and that's it. <laughs> this is amazing. Like, it was a child. And so you can, you can pass this to, to your students, to your friends, and this would come, like, you know, it's, it's causing our emotions. It's surprising. Whoa! 12-year-old child did this. Uh, so this is good. This is a good way to start explaining science. It's show the humans behind it. And many humans, like everyone has a story. So we can show this, this person's story. Uh, we have tragical deaths. Like, I'm going to show <laughs> some. But uh, a tragical one was probably you know, uh, from Galileo. This is famous, let's get some, oh, there's another very good one. Like in the ancient Greek, we had some women doing science and one famous one is Hypatia. I don't know if you have heard about her. There are movies about her. And she had a threshold death. She was like inside the university doing her research. No, come back here. Uh, she was doing her research 
And then by that time, the, the Inquisition started putting fire into the universities and they set fire on her. So that was a practical death. Uh, I mean, that's pretty sad, but if it is this, she mentioned uh, the thing that she did. Um, we have amazing random facts that I'm going to show later, but you can imagine that by century 16, we had people creating uh, pocket calculators. That's amazing. We are talking about like 1753, 1754. We have people creating pocket calculators. Like, this is amazing. This is a random fact, but it's a curious fact. So you can use all these curious facts about people to stimulate them to learn about science. Uh, just a second. Okay. Uh, so, one example that you can use, I mentioned Pascal, I, I'm going to show you another, another one, which is Kepler. What does come to your mind when I say Kepler? Ellipses. Orges. Well, keep, keep saying. Orges? Yeah. Uh, packing, like, packing spheres into a box. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but we have Kepler's laws. How many laws were there? Three laws of Kepler, yeah. <laughs> if you remember something, you might remember that Kepler did three laws. You, you probably don't know what or about what, but you know, Kepler is a fam fam familiar name for Kepler laws. Some of you might remember gravitation or stuff like this. Uh, okay, if you watch it, that movie, Interstellar, someone mentions Kepler, Kepler's laws, so. But Kepler has a very interesting story. This guy, he suffered so many Catholic Church chases and threats, but so many, but so many, so many, that like every time he got a new chase, and you read, you read his history, you, you keep saying like, isn't he dead yet? <laughs> isn't he dead yet? Not yet, not yet, because he was pretty, you know, he was doing uh, a bunch of wrong things, according to Catholic Church, and by that time, Inquisition could kill you, could throw you on the fire. And Kepler's scientific research was, you know, on the opposite direction of what Catholic Church wanted you to think. So this is pretty amazing. Uh, not, not amazing, but it's a curious fact. Uh, do, you know, do you know that probably Kepler was the first sci-fi writer on the history? He wrote a book about science fiction uh, of an expedition to the moon. So this is you know, the roots of science fiction. So this is very interesting, like, if you, if you enjoy Star Wars, or things like this, you should ask yourself, like, who was the first sci-fi writer that we had? Probably it was Kepler. So yes, you should take a look at this book, it's very interesting, especially because we are talking about 16-something, so it's been a while, and by that time, there were crazy people thinking about going to the moon. That's, do you know that? Do people tell you about this? They should, because this is very interesting. And by reading this book, you can understand Kepler's, Kepler's passion about astronomy, which is very interesting. Uh, he came from a very poor family, I mean, very, very, very poor, and he was able to move forward on his research and passion because of a friend, Tisha Bright. And this story is very interesting because Tisha was, you know, that stereotype of a rich person who spends a lot of money with parties, with guests, with stuff. I want to buy a ship. Okay, I can buy a ship. So that, this is the stereotype uh, related into history books about Tisha. And you can compare the difference between Kepler 
personality and teach your personality, and it's very interesting. Uh, another, okay, I'm, I'm just commenting, like I said, Kepler was doing uh, things that were opposite to what Catholic Church wanted him to do. Uh, I don't know if you know, but by that time, officially until 18 something, 1812 or something, uh, Catholic Church tried to force the people to believe that the earth is the center of the universe, uh, which is, okay, doesn't make sense. Uh, and Kepler's research was uh, a second part of Copernicus study about heliocentrism, and that was forbidden by Catholic Church. They wanted people to think that we were in the center of the universe forever. So that's why Kepler suffered so many, so many threats, chases, and so on. That's, that's the same reason that Galileo uh, had trouble with Catholic Church, because, all because of heliocentrism. And this is a very interesting story. Uh, so we have some benefits uh, for teaching Kepler's life story for students or people. Uh, for example, we can bring some points about Renaissance time. We need to learn about Renaissance, Renaissance time. So that could be an introduction or a complement subject. Uh, so can you see the link between people, <coughs> history, and math? <coughs> We should use this kind of link more constantly because this makes all the subjects more interesting. Uh, we can teach about inquisition, uh, we can teach about heliocentrism just by talking about Kepler, Kepler's life. And we can show, we can also link everything with literature because of the book he wrote about science fiction. So can you see that there is a giant link between subjects and our education, educational system does, does not explore this. So they wanted to treat things you know, like boxes. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Uh, another example we can talk about is Euler. I've heard about Euler. This is a bad question because this guy he made so many things, but so many things in so many areas that we, we can actually say what does come to your mind when you say Euler, depends on your background. But just for you to have an idea, after Euler's death, the, the, the editors still had material, new material from Euler to publish for the next 50 years. So this guy made a lot of Thanks a lot in many areas. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about Euler. Uh, Euler is is an interesting uh, person to talk about uh, because he got blind by the age of forty five or something. But by the age of thirty, he lost his left eye, and by the age of forty something, he lost both eyes. And he kept doing math, even blind. And he also found something about some calculations about moon size when he was blind. That's awkward. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, but he did. And we should talk about these examples. Um, so I can read what is that, but uh, one thing very important about Euler is to talk about his ability of mental calculations. I'm not saying that everyone should calculate like 175 squared mentally. Some people can do this, but this is not the point. This is the point that you can show people that if a blind guy made this, you also can do this. Because you have paper and a pencil. So this is very interesting. I mean, it's a curiosity that you can use for stimulating students or people. Or even showing mental calculations techniques, because we have, we have all of those techniques. When I was a child, I wanted to learn this. But my parents didn't care. 
And then I found out, oh, there was a guy, Euler, he was able to do that. How did he do that? So this is interesting. Don't assume that there won't be interested people. You always can find people who want to learn this kind of thing. Uh, so the benefits, uh, you can stimulate students who are having trouble or struggling, and you can show, hey, you can also do this. Come on, don't give up. Don't give up. You still have your eyes. Uh, Euler did it. So this is, in my honest opinion, depending on your approach, of course, like to say, hey, he was blind, he did it. You're a bastard. You can do this. No, don't do this, don't do this kind of thing. But simulate people. Um, you can also teach about uh, medical issues, like maybe link to a biology class or something. Uh, and you can help to stop budding. I studied with people who had uh, eye disabilities, and by the time I studied at school, we had a lot of fun. And like the professors were not worried about stopping this. Uh, and the ones who were, they didn't have solid examples for the children. Because we were by the age of seven, eight, and it's good to have real examples for the children. So we can use other as an example of uh, eye disability. Uh, there are several other examples. Uh, the second technique that I wanted to show you uh, is that about movies. Movies are a good technique. Uh, for example, I'm going to show in the first slide, but this worked for Alan Turing. Did you watch the movie of Alan Turing, the imitation game? This worked a lot. I mean, I saw a lot of positive feedback of undergrad students who watched the movie and came home motivated to study Turing machines without having a test on the next week. Which is good. <laughs> uh, a movie that should people should make it. I don't know if you, if you heard about this guy, Eva Hitch Galois. Uh, this guy has a very interesting story for a movie. Why? Uh, he was a guy who was born in French, and you can talk about French history in the movie. Uh, he made a lot of math, and he was involved into the French uh, Revolution that was happening. Uh, so he was, you know, he was. Uh, a politician by that time. Uh, he was a young mad genius. He developed what we call group theory. Uh, but he also was very active into politics. And he had a lot of political enemies who were chasing him. Uh, he was fighting against absolutism that we had in France. So you can imagine the amount of trouble that he was attracting by willing to fight with a king. You, you can imagine the scenario. Uh, he, was, he developed all those math theories about groups and so, and he was totally ignored and forgotten by mathematical community, and he got extremely angry of the fact, obvious. did wonderful things, and he submitted papers and so, and the professors just, you know, Oh, I'm going to see this later. And like 10 years later, someone, you know, was searching for a paper and they found out Galois papers. That was his story. So he has the right to be frustrated. Uh, this happens a lot. Well, too. That, that's it. Uh, he was seduced. History tells that he was seduced about a young woman and she was engaged to another politician. And they end up in a duel, and yeah, so this is a typical story of a movie, but that, that was true. And he was killed in that duel. But some people tell that this, this woman that appeared, she was like, her appearance was planned just to attract him, just to cause a duel, just to kill him. Just to kill Galois, because he was a very influent person into politics. 
So people believe that this woman was a, a friend of the king and everything was planned. There are some conspiracy behind. So this is the perfect movie. <laughs> Why don't people do this? And with this, you can teach people group theory, <laughs> which is very important. Okay, you saw many subjects about the movie, but you can grab group theory. Galois is also responsible for what I call modern algebra. I mean, sorry, I'm not a mathematician. I just study math for hobby. So <laughs> I learned some stuff. Uh, okay, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, so, one thing very important. When you talk about mathematics or physics or stuff, show that we have humans behind it. It's not just calculations. It's about humans. So I really enjoy Open Source Bridge because every session someone reminds me that I'm still being a human being. From the keynotes to the sessions, you know. So this is very important. Uh, like this movie technique, I, I really believe this work. I, mean, I saw this on Alan Turing movie. I saw this for the theory of everything. It's mostly a drama, but you can see an increase of Stephen Hawking's books selling. So that's good. That, I mean, I don't know if the, the people are going to read this, but they the, they showed like they were at least interested in knowing what what is this guy is, is this guy doing. Uh, so the final part is how do I apply this technique to computer science. Like, the, I studied computer engineering, but it's the same principle. So some uh, tips to connect uh, math and physics teaching with uh, a main area of study that you are having, like programming, like electronics. So one example that I found, and I asked my professors to pass, and they gave me a positive feedback, is to teach numerical methods during the algorithms, algorithm structures class. This works. Why? Because, did you, did you, have, did you study a uh, numerical calculus? Maybe yes. So it's mainly algorithms. Uh, and you can teach the technique behind the calculus and ask the students to implement this. So they will be at the same time writing code, which is something that most people might enjoy more than ca pure calculus and you know uh, equation solving. And at the same time, they will learn what is behind that numerical method. So this is a good idea. I don't know if if professors do do this kind of thing in the, the U.S. I have never heard about this kind of examples like. I'm talking about unifying both disciplines into just one. And we had this in Brazil and it was amazing. And the results were pretty good. So this is one tip. Uh, of course, they'll tell the story behind the numerical method and tell the story behind the algorithm. We need this for computer science too. Another example, you can teach statistics during your UI or UX classes. Because UI UX mainly involves the statistics. Do you have A-B tests? Yes. So you, you are going to collect data. And how do you treat this data that you collect? How do you know if your uh, UX is good enough for that kind of user? You need to know how to, how to manage this data. So it's a good time to teach statistics. I have never seen an example of this, but I think it's totally valid. I mean, I had to deal a lot with statistics when I was doing UX work. A lot. I had a ton of A-B tests coming, and what, like, is 10% of error something significant? Maybe yes, maybe no. So this is pure statistics. You could use this example. Um, so, of course, uh, everyone 
who is doing science, except to robots, because sometimes they do, uh, are humans, like me, like everyone in this room, and people should, you know, <laughs> spread this message more and more. Because I know some people that gave up on math or calculus because they said it was, oh, it's too hard for me. Have you heard that? Oh, it's too hard for me, I can't do this. Of course you can. A human being like you made this. So of course, maybe you are not that interested or that motivated, but this shouldn't be a barrier to you to make this kind of thing. Um, so maybe this kind of story stimulates other people or their students. And in software development, we have been trying to identify the areas, right? Maybe the box is an example of this. The person who writes code is the person who can uh, deal with your relic. And so we've been trying to find uh, people who can manage different areas. Or at least, you know, to communicate better with people of different areas. We need to do this for math. I mean, I, I know a lot of brilliant mathematicians and brilliant physicians, but they know just a few about programming, and they have, like, a problem. And they can, they can imagine how to solve that problem. And if we, from computer science, we had a better approach with these people, maybe we could potentialize science development. If we ha I have time, I can uh, mention uh, a real example of this. Uh, never, never do this. Because it's, it's not your professor's fault, it's not the student's fault, it's mainly an educational problem. Like, okay, I had a terrible professor, but it's not their fault. It's not. I, today I can see that it was not their fault. Uh, my small contribution to this, like I've been complaining, complaining, and giving examples, I decided to write uh, a small blog with a quick posts about uh, math history, and I'm still writing some random posts. Uh, but I show concepts in a humanized way. So I give you the concepts of the person, the concepts of the science involved, and I mention what it did. And if you get interested, based on this history, you can I leave some links and you can open and figure it out. Uh, we should have this kind of thing into the books that we use during the courses. They should contextualize us. Uh, so thank you for coming. I hope you have enjoyed the session. And if you have any questions or ways to have it, five minutes. I still have five minutes. So I'd like to mention one very important way to unify the areas. I, I usually read papers during my free time. Please don't judge me. It's, it's my real Robbie. So I have here a paper from Cambridge. I have annotations on this. And the title of the paper is Maxwell's Fluid Model for Magnetism. So the guy took fluid, fluid mechanics, electromagnetism, and connected this. Apparently, like two very different areas which doesn't make any sense to work together, but there is a similarity between vectorial calculus on this. And these guys, they unify this. And if you check like their uh, further work, they say, ah, oh, we need a software, and a, a, an algorithm for this, and hey, we can make it. We have Big data, we have Cassandra, we have New4j, we have Julia, we have stuff. We know this, but they don't. And it's not their fault. So we need to interact more actively with this community. It's not our fault, because they are still relatively like closed. They don't have you know, open source math. I, ha I haven't seen this. But it's our responsibility to you. I mean, let's search for these people. If you are passionate about math, nothing can stop you. Uh,
to the same way we contribute to open source, we can contribute to different areas of research because we still know how to program and there are some people who don't. They can make calculations, they can create mathematical models, but they probably need someone who knows programming and we can help them just by understanding that they are human. So this is very interesting. So I think we have time for a question. Anyone? So I'll be around if you want to talk about this. So thank you so much for attending. Yeah.